Welcome to Ball and Play, presented by Baseball News Club. We cover everything with a ball and stick around the world. We cover Major League Baseball, to international, Dominican, Australian, to Korean. We also cover NCAA Baseball Division I and softball, all the way on down, Little League softball, to T-ball. We cover over the line, wiffle ball, anything with a ball and stick. We will cover it here at Ball and Play. Please stop right now. I need you to subscribe. Please comment and also turn on your notifications. Thank you very much. And let's get started with this journey we call baseball. Welcome to Ball and Play, episode number eight. This is Sesma. I'll be your host. Ball and Play is presented by Baseball News Club. And uh, we got an action-packed show today, guys, like we always do. This is episode eight. Um, first off, just want to say, please subscribe. Please download. Please follow us on Instagram. We are Baseball News Club. Again, if you want to follow great baseball every day, 724 hours, just plug into our Baseball Newsweek stories. We post non-stop all day long stories updating you on everything with the ball and stick also we got our ig ball and play and then primarily baseball news club on youtube so please support us and let's get this show going man we've got an absolutely great show of course we're going to talk about the cba but you know what man i don't want to spend too much time on it just yet we're going to talk heavy ncaa of course kbo Nippin baseball schedules, Jack Flaherty's in the news, Derek Jeter, Bryce Harper, Edward Encarnacion, I love that name. Uh, we're going to talk about injured players' impact on fantasy. Marcus Stroman, Joe Kelly, really bad news for the Red Sox, uh, minor league player Brett Netzer, uh, Goose Gossage, Joey Gallo, Dontrell Willis. We've got an action pack show for you. So again, let's get this started. Now, like usual... We want to thank our uh, all of our followers on all of our social media channels. Uh, we really do appreciate it. And we also want to thank those who are downloading our podcast. We really appreciate it. We always give a shout out to all of our peeps. Um, let's see. Recently, let me pull up my stats right now. So we want to thank iTunes, Chrome, Podbean, uh, Apple Podcasts, a lot of our listeners out there. We actually have listeners all around the world. So we want to thank everybody around the world that listens to our podcast and downloads. We really appreciate it. But let's move on to news. Let's get talking baseball. We're going to start off with the Boston Red Sox. Kind of really crappy news. Uh, Boston Red Sox release Brett Netz Netzer. Man, talk about somebody that posted themselves out of a job. He posted racist, anti-gay, anti-Semitic, calling black people to return to Africa tweets on Twitter. Yeah. He just went, I don't know what happened to this guy. He hasn't really played or done much in the minors. He wasn't going to come up to the majors, but the Red Sox released him, obviously. But man, he made comments to the Red Sox chief baseball officer, Cham Bloom, who is Jewish. He was a big target of this guy, too. So... Now, according to stats and other articles, he was never going to have a chance to make it to the show anyhow. Man, that happened last Friday. Today is Tuesday, March 1st. As of Saturday, he deleted those tweets, obviously. But man, I don't... Listen, man. One thing that social media has brought out, and one thing anyone that's listening right now, especially you younger guys and girls out there, you need to learn... To grow up, man, to look at a person for the color of their skin, the way they act or whatever, and to hate on them, you've got fucking issues, man. You need to sit underneath the tree and realize that's not 99% of the world. When you do that and you act like that, you just make yourself look so stupid. And again, you can believe in that stuff all you want, but when you think about it, you're just being ignorant, stupid, and look at what this guy, he lost a job. I've seen people lose jobs at companies for saying the same crap and actually i've seen people lose jobs for less i've seen a supervisor just make a joke about a short person he got canned so all i'm saying is is why would you want to do something so stupid how ignorant do you have to be to think that 
people that are different than you are bad or something, or you have the right to talk about them like that, listen, man, you guys, the world's getting better. But unfortunately, we're always going to have a few idiots like that in the world to just think that, you know, hey, what they say is truth. It's not truth. It's just stupid people. So, you know what? Good riddance to Brett, man. I'll be seeing you in a co-ed softball league soon, idiot. So, it's just unbelievable. Let's move on to positive news. Toronto Blue Jays unveiled 2022 New Era Spring Training Hat. Yeah, the irony's kind of crappy on this one, but it's a totally tight hat. If you guys get an opportunity, go to Blue Jays on Instagram or, you know, just use your favorite search engine and find it. Now, uh, let's move on to other news. I told you I got a lot of stuff. Joey Gallo on MLB on Fox complaining about hitting versus the shift. Man, I got to tell you, I love the freaking comments on this. Everybody joined in and destroyed them. It's like, dude, I get it. Now, the shift, I feel like, is turning into the new modern uh, debate. It used to be designated hitter. I think this is just another sliver of major league topics that people like to run on over and over and over with their... You know what I'm saying? There's just certain things in major league baseball that uh, DH or the shift or, you know sticky substance where there's a very much black and gray or at least two sides of the fence you get people for it, people for against it but anyhow um it's interesting news because you're in the major leagues and joey gallo it's not like and i'm not trying to make you joey gallo fans get all upset but not like the guy could freaking hit anyways. I think the highest he's ever hit is 253. He's always in the low 200s, under 200. He can't even hit the Mendoza line. And he's complaining. Oh, I, I hate the shift. Now, I, I've i heard two, you know, I know the arguments between both sides. Some people are like, hey, I, I you know, it's no fair that you got to put two guys on one side. Blah, blah, blah. Dude, you're making millions of dollars. You need to learn to hit oppo. Bring those hands in and just freaking drop the bat. And when you... <laughs> Come on, man. I'm a right-handed hitter, so it's me pulling. But I'm a spray hitter. I've always been a spray hitter because I like to hit the ball where it's at and drive it. So to me, I don't care. But if I'm a dead pull hitter, yeah, I'm going to whine and cry about it. But think about the philosophy. He's whining and crying the fact because he can't play the game. I mean, the game is hitting opposite, hitting the ball everywhere. What are you going to do when you go to a team and they need you to go opposite field in the playoffs? You're not going to be able to freaking do it. You know what I'm saying? Like a right-handed hitter, yeah, you know, I'm looking, it's all strategy. When there's a man on first, I'm looking at that hole on the right side. And I've learned that over my career playing baseball or softball or wherever I'm at. If there's a runner on first and they're keeping him on, I'm looking at that hole. Because that's baseball strategy. So it's like, well, does Joey Gallo just not understand baseball strategy? And I think that's a funny argument or a discussion because there's a lot of players that are just, I wouldn't say they're lucky, but they're in the major leagues because they fit a certain type of you know certain type of part or a certain type of position he's a he's a good fielder got a good arm but dude come on man you you're gonna complain about the shift dude hit oppo if i'm a left-handed hitter and i look over and I see the third baseman in the shortstop position or towards you know second base dude hit opposite field it's just it's mind-blowing and they pitch you to that side They'll pitch you to your strengths and your weaknesses, but they're going to pitch you to your weaknesses a lot. Dude, you know the ball's going outside. Hit opposite field. So I find that very hilarious that Joey Gallo is complaining. He did horrible for the Yankees when he came over from Texas. I think he hit like a buck 90 or something. I could be wrong. I know he hit under 200, but I feel like he hit a buck 60. You know what? Let me, I'm going to, let me baseball reference that right now, but um, why I'm looking that up again, it just blows my mind that you're gonna sit there and complain about hitting opposite field um, <laughs> You're a major league player uh, How much money are you making in order to not hit opposite field? Well, now yeah, that's an easy, you know, he's arbitration eligible in 2022 is a free agent next year in 2023 um, He batted 160 for the Yankees. He batted 223 for the Rangers. So he batted 206 on the or uh, for the season. He batted 199 with 213 strikeouts. And here's the thing, guys: 213 strikeouts tells me one thing. He had 207 in 2018. He's just a hacker. 
Uh, yeah, he gets a lot of base on balls. I don't know why. Because he's a hacker. He hit 38 home runs. He just swinging for the fence, man. That's all he does. Um, I mean, think about it. You got a guy hitting 41 home runs, you only have 80 RBIs. 40 home runs, you have 92 RBIs. 38 home runs, you only get 77. It reminds me of certain players in the past where they would hit home runs, but their RBIs were super low. It tells you. Just look at the metrics. It just tells you what kind of player this is. And he got two All-Star games. He's a good, he's a good fielder. How the hell you got an all-star game with the 199 average? You know, Jesus, you know, what the hell's going on? It's just like uh, Bader in St. Louis only playing barely 100 games again, a gold glove. It just doesn't make sense. But, hey, you know, it's a fan theme. So whenever you hear me complain or, or whine, I'll never, ever whine about a player making a all-star game. I might tease it or joke about it. But you know what? The reason why I don't, because it's all about the fans. This is what the fans want. So if the fans want a buck 99 hitter in the All-Star game, fine. Let him go in there. But I'm just saying, it's the guy is not that good of a player. He's a good fielder. Even though he was drafted first round draft in the 2012 MLB June Aperture draft from Bishop Gorman High School in Las Vegas. I just, it, you know, when I see players say stuff like that, it just cracks me up. Because it just makes you look stupid, dude. If I'm a major league player, I would never, ever, ever talk about the shift. You know what I'm saying? There's other things you could complain about that you have better control of. Umpires, uh, you know, getting brush back, stuff like that. But I don't know, man. Just not a good idea. Anyways, I want to give you guys a blast from the past. This was a great player that all of us loved. And he was big on the scene and then he went away. And I know most of you know who I'm talking about. Dontrell Willis. You guys remember Dontrell Willis? Uh, you know what? The reason he came up this week is I was reading some articles and he popped up on the radar and was like, oh man, I haven't heard that name in a long time. He stopped playing in 2011. The dude started playing in 2003. He was an all-star his first two out of three seasons. But if you remember, he had that 22-10 and 10 season. Um, he had a phenomenal season uh, for the fish back in the day. And then his career was cut short, injuries and other things. But I just wanted to bring that blast from the past. The D-Train. Yeah, D-Train. Awesome player. Uh, rookie of the year, 2003. I mean, he went 3.30 ERA, 14-6. and six. He was great for the first five seasons. Maybe not that 5.17 ERA in 2007. But when he went to Detroit, it was all downhill. Now, what made Dontrell stick out was his unorthodox type of pitching. Um, he had a really weird stance, but you know, he, he got injured when he went over to Detroit and just struggled, couldn't get back on track, uh, after the, he went over to Detroit and just things just kept on going downhill for him. So just one of those guys that unfortunately had mass potential, but never really panned out. And if you also remember, he was a great hitter. He hit a grand slam, I think against the Mets at one point. But once he get in, once he got that knee injury when he went over to Detroit, he struggled a lot with his commanding, walking a lot, and it's just the rest of his career he couldn't get his ERA down. Uh, he didn't really appear that much, and his final appearance was when he was 29. Uh, he tried making a comeback, but injuries and struggles couldn't do it for him. So today, he gone. Um, he is a a contributing analyst for different locations and stuff like that. Uh, you can mostly find him on NBC Sports Bay Area where he covers the Oakland Athletics. So, D-Train. Just thought I'd throw a little blast at the past of you guys. All right, let's move on to other news. This is a name you're going to love. Joe Kelly, Dodgers pitcher, Astro fans' favorite pitcher of all time, Major League Baseball fans, one of the most popular guys in the sport because of what he, he did against the Astros. He wants to come back to L.A. Um, why not? You know, Joe's been a big part of L.A. for a while, and he's a good pitcher, but he made a comment this week that he does want to return to uh, Los Angeles Dodgers. So let's see what happens. I mean, I would love to see him back in there. He's Man, he his stuff moves around so much when he throws the ball. Um, he, he's got great stuff, man. I mean, you look at his career, the dude's done pretty good. I mean, he threw last year at age 33. He had a 
ERA for Los Angeles, that's not that bad. 2020 had a 1.80. I mean, when you look at 19, where he had a 4.56, and then 18, he had a 4.39. But before that, he just was blistering, you know, with his his pitches. But I don't think that year was that bad of a season for him. Uh, 48 games, not really a lot. But, you know, 286 is not bad for an ERA. He had a .97 whip. So, hey. Uh, you know, why not bring him back? He's a free agent. I think Joe Kelly would be a great arm for a lot of people. Now, this leads me into other free agencies. So we're going to move into another topic. And we're going to be bouncing around a lot today. But what I want to talk about, and we've talked about it before, is fantasy baseball and players that are injured. It's a really interesting year for fantasy baseball fans because there's some players that you're just not 100% what you're going to get out of them anymore. And I'll I'll go down a list for you. Um, We've talked about these before. Mike Clevenger, San Diego Padres. What are you going to get out of Mike? I mean, is that a good chip to pick up as a fantasy team? I mean, if Mike's healthy, yeah, he's he can eat innings, he can be up there. But what is he? You know, I think the key and the thing that's tough for a lot of fantasy is when you get great a great opportunity for a great player and they're coming off an injured year. You're kind of like. I mean, Mike Trout, again, we still don't still know what's going on with him. And I tell you, man, no team in baseball has had as much drama as the LA Angels. Not even close. I mean, with Mike Trout and then, you know, just recently with the, the Harvey incident with the drugs, I mean, just on and on and on, Pujols and bad contracts. And they're just a horrible team, but they've done a lot in offseason, drafting 20 pitchers with 20 picks in the 21 major league drafts, signing – all types of players, Iglesias Noah and seven international pitchers. So they are making it happen. But again, if you're a fantasy, you know, they're saying Mike Trout might be back. That's his goal to be back for spring training. There's still no word on Mike Trout. So if you're a fantasy guy and you get Mike Trout right now, you're probably like, yeah, I'm going to take him. But you might not. We don't know what's going on with Mike Trout. Jordan Hicks, same thing. Is he going to go back to two years ago with St. Louis, the way he was thrown two or three years ago? What's going to happen with Jordan Hicks? I mean, he's a great little chip, you know, to pick up. But, again, he's a relief guy, so you're not going to get a lot of innings out of him. But Jacob DeGrom, is he going to be 100% this year? Um, Do you pick him up? Kyle Lewis, same thing, a little bit of injuries last year. What's he going to be like? Steven Strasburg, another arm that's like, man, is he going to be 100% this year? Clayton Kershaw, same thing. Mookie Betts, Mookie didn't really have a great Mookie's year, but I think with Mookie, out of all the players I'm naming, Mookie's the one I think would be a good bet to pick up for fantasy because he did play last year. He just was playing injured and he wasn't 100%. Justin Verlander, what are you going to get out of him? I mean, dude, okay, the way I see Justin Verlander is this way. The guy is a fantastic pitcher, and he's a power pitcher. And sometimes with these power pitchers as they get older – They become more finessed. They become better um, at pitching. And I'm just kind of curious if that's Justin Verlander. Um, Is he going to be able to pitch at age, I think it's 37, 38? He didn't play in 2021. So my my correction, um, homeboy is now, how old is he? Oh, dude, he's 39. (laughs) But here's the thing. Verlander is always a workhorse. He's always a strikeout guy. He really turned the corner late in his career. He had some fantastic seasons for Houston. He's been consistent as hell his whole career. Um, Hall of Famer? Pfft. Yeah. You got 3,000 strikeouts. Uh, yeah. You got a Cy Young, a Rookie of the Year, an MVP. Oh, two Cy Young, excuse me. Sorry, Verlander fans. Don't yell at me. Um, he's a fantastic pitcher. But, you know, he's got a ring. Sorry. Got a ring. Uh, what are you going to get out of him? Is he going to be able to come back? I think anything to get out of Dustin is going to be, or Justin, excuse me, is going to be awesome. Uh, he's actually a chip I would pick up. Like he's a guy I'd be like, you know what? I'll take Dustin or Justin. (laughs) Oh, I keep calling him Dustin. Um, I would pick up Justin Verlander. I think that'd be a good pick because he's a, as long as he's healthy, man, he's going to be in there. He's a bull. So I don't know. Fantasy. It's why I don't do fantasy. I don't. Just because of the fact that I don't have time. If I started doing fantasy, Jesus, man, I'd be doing this all day long. I I just, I did fantasy baseball one year, and and luckily I was single at the time, so I didn't have to 
deal with the relationship. I've been in a relationship, guys, for a long time. I can't do fantasy. I can, but what I'm saying is I can't do it at the level I want it to. I want to be totally involved. I want to be doing fantasy all day long, looking at who I'm going to put in, who I'm going to play. I love fantasy, but I just, I'm the type of person, obviously by the fact that I run a a uh, podcast about anything with a ball and stick, obviously I'm infatuated, so I can't just focus on just MLB is what I'm saying. My job is to bring you guys everything around the world, and we're going to be talking about all types of stuff today, uh, the KBO and nip and schedules, Japanese baseball, uh, but we'll get into that in a second. Edward Encarnacion. There's talk of him returning to Major League Baseball as a DH. There's a good chance we're getting him DH this year whenever we play baseball. Um, having him back. Hey, man. Not a bad idea. I love that guy. I mean, the name itself. You know, I love his name. But he's always been a clutch player. He's always been a decent player. Uh, there's talk of him returning to Major Leagues as a DH. Why not? In other news, uh, Bryce Harper jokes on Twitter. So what Bryce Harper did recently on Instagram has got everyone quite active on social media, and it's great. He goes, aye, you more giants, you up? Got some time to kill? He wrote that on his Instagram story, so everyone's loving it because it's like, ah, you know, if they go on strike, then maybe Bryce Harper will be in Japan. And, uh, dude, that'd be awesome. Dude, Japan would love Bryce Harper. Uh, despite what you think about him, Bryce Harper's a stud. And to see him over in Japan would be awesome. And now I have to say I was trolling <laughs> some comments because I always try to get the pulse of baseball out there. I was looking at a post about this with Bryce Harper and some people were like, oh, he's going to hit two home run, 200 home runs. Dude, don't. Come on, man. You guys know baseball better than that. Come on, man. We got been giving you updates on international ball all the time. There ain't no way in hell he's hitting 200 home runs. Dude, Japanese pitching is good. We get a ton of talent out there. They know how to pitch. It's not that easy. Bryce ain't hitting no... He'll hit 30 or 40, but there's no way he's hitting no 60 or anything like that. It's not like that in Japan. And uh, they'll just pitch around you. So for this one guy to say that, I was just like, dude, do you even know what you're talking about, man? <laughs> this is... Uh, Japan baseball is very competitive. But anyhow, that's news with Bryce Harper. I thought that was awesome. I really did. Um, Let's see... Oh, let's move on to other news. Derek Jeter is out as CEO of the Marlins. Very contentious announcement. A lot of people like Derek Jeter in that position, but there's a lot of Marlins fans and a lot of baseball fans He say that he ruined the Marlins. Straight up. Traded some key players around. Did not make them competitive when they should have been. A lot of... I don't know. How can you say it? There's a lot of bad blood with him and Marlins fans. He's not a popular CEO, and he steps down. So, uh, Jeter, Jeter joined the Marlins as a minority owner in September of 2017. Now, that is an ownership group led by Bruce Sherman. After acquiring the team, under Jeter's leadership, the Marlins went 218-327. and 327. So, 218 wins, 327 losses in four seasons, finishing a record of 31-29 during the Shortened COVID season. Um, really didn't do anything. But Jeter's already trying to, I guess you can say, take a stab on the way out. And he said this, and I quote verbatim, Today I am announcing that the Miley Marlins and I are officially ending our relationship and I will no longer serve as CEO as our shillholder in the club. But then he went on to say, We had a vision five years ago to turn the Marlins and the franchise around. And as a CEO, I am proud to put my name and rotation on the line to make the planet reality. Through hard work, trust, and accountability, we transformed every aspect of the franchise, reshaping the workforce, redeveloping long-term strategic plan for success. Oh, yeah. Okay. But then he said, the current vision of the franchise in its future is different than the one he signed up to lead. So, I don't know. I don't know. You, you talk to Marlins fans, you get... Two different stories. They really hated him there because he started getting rid of some very popular players and contracts when he got in there, and they weren't competitive. He had five years, man. I mean, four years, and he really didn't make your team competitive. Is it a question of he made the organization better and the minors? Well, that's something we're going to have to see down the road. But anyhow, let's move on to other news. Let's talk international ball. 
Uh, first off with the KBO, that's the Korean Baseball Organization. Remember, Yasuo Puig is over there. And, you know, he said something funny today. I know he's doing tongue-in-cheek because I don't think he'd be... I hope he's not dumb enough. Um, he said, you know, talking about bat flips and kissing the bat. He's in Korea. This is a different theme. And I, don't, I think he's just joking around because if you've been following our podcast, he's talked about four years in different segments, how each year impacted his life and how he's learned a lot about it. I really believe Puig is trying. He's making a million dollars playing for the KBO. He's going to really try hard to get back into Major League Baseball, and I think he has a good crack at it. But you can't go over to a foreign team, international team, and being what you were in the past. I know we love Puig. But you have to understand, when you screw up and you're trying to get back into the graces and get back into your job or Major League Baseball, you got to be squeaky clean. He has a reputation. I love Puig. But he knows this is a not just a second chance. It's like his fourth or fifth. But he realizes this at his point in his career. It's very important for him to be successful in the KBO. They start um, March 12th, exhibition. So the KBO is starting, guys. And there's ways you can watch this. I told you guys about VIP box. But they're going to have those games going coming up next week. So if you want to follow Puig, follow him on his Instagram. It's a, He posts all the time. He's posting more now, obviously, than he ever has. Because he's just sitting at his place in Korea and he's got nothing to do. Uh, I told you a couple weeks ago he flew there. He had his uh, Los Angeles Dodgers swag bag when he was going over there with all his equipment. He's playing in Korea now. It's a different country. Different rules, different ways to respect the game. Totally different. This might be a great opportunity for him. I think it is. Uh, Rachel Luba, his agents, got him over there. I think it's a fantastic opportunity. But again, I know fans in the chat when he mentioned about flipping bats and joking around, uh, he was basically saying it like, hey, this shouldn't be a problem. And the fans were like, yeah, go ahead and do it in KBO. They flip bats all year long. You know, That's all they do is flip bats. That's not true, man. They're, they're very... Uh, Korean and, and Japanese baseball, they're much more respectable towards the sport than we are. I think Puig is just joking around. He knows full well he has to behave. Uh, if he gets in a fight over there, his career is not going to be coming back. He's Right now, his career, he has to get everything perfect. He has to play well. He has to behave well. He's got a lot he has to do to get back in the graces of Major League Baseball. And I know some of you are like, oh, that's not true. No, I guarantee it's true because he's already talked about how it's true. So... There it is. He knows what he has to do. Now, Nippon Baseball, which what Bryce Harper's talking about, uh, they start on March 25th. So their season's coming up. So what I've been encouraging for you guys, and we're going to jump into Tommy Tinks here in a little bit, NC Wolfpacks um, college ball, is that uh, there's plenty going on. So if Major League can't get their shit together, guys, we've got KBO, we've got Nippon, which you can watch on VIP Box. But again, they're different time zones. So if you're going to watch stuff, you're going to have to stay up after midnight or get up super ass early. Um, but college is it, guys. College is just smoking this year, man. Smoking. And we're going to talk a lot of college and a lot of MLB. And I'll tell you this, guys. You're, you're already seeing videos being posted on YouTube by us. I just put Tommy Tanks on there the other night. It's already blown up with views. Uh, we're going to be uh, focusing on NCAA a lot. So... This is what we do here. We try to focus Major League primarily, but we're going to be focusing on every other way that we can bring you anything with a ball and stick. Little League, T-ball, softball's going on. All the little kids out there from T-ball on up, you guys are getting your gear on, and we talk about this before in a podcast. If you're a young person listening to this podcast and you're like, I don't know if I want to play this year, do me a favor. Just go out there and do it. When you get to the end of the season, then decide if you're not going to play the next season. But give it a try, guys. Go back. Of course you're not the best player on the team in some cases. Listen, the best player on the team was not, not always the best player on the team. And if that's your only reason to be out there, maybe baseball's not your sport. You need to go out there for your own injure, individual accomplishments. You need to go out there and love the game. You got to love the smell of the field and dirt on your hand and the crack of the bat and the fans in the stands and sunflower seeds that are everywhere on the ground. You know, that's baseball, guys. You got to love the game, but get into it. And I encourage you guys to do that. But again, if MLB continues with their lockout crap, which we're going to talk about in a second. But what I'm, I want to throw your way now is we're going to go CBA. So we're going to talk lockout right now. Today is Tuesday, uh, 10 a.m. in the morning. Uh, Major League Baseball stayed late last night. They went 
supposedly 15 hours or something like that, trying to iron it out, and they're carrying it over today. Super positive sign. But let's talk. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about a bunch of things and a bunch of players' reactions. We, this is this is heavy, but we're only spend five or ten minutes on this. And you want to know why Major League Baseball? You did not earn. You did not earn my interest. So I'm going to spend five or ten minutes with you, and then the rest on NCAA baseball and softball. And again, if you guys, well, if you guys that listen to my podcast, you know I bring the juiciness at the end. I always bring the bulk of what we're going to talk about towards the end. Usually that's MLB. But you know what? We talk about everything with a ball and stick. So if Blitzball is getting more news and is more important, or NCAA or international ball, we're going to use that for our closing topic. So today we're closing with NCAA. So let's just run over the stupid lockdown because that's pretty much what it is. Now I got to thinking... You know, because as fans, we get to choose sides. We're thinking like owners or MLB, or we're thinking like players. Because the majority of us, or large percent of us, love baseball. We love to play it when we can at any level, either wiffle ball all the way up to college, all the way up, you know, whatever level you play at. Um, <clears throat> my whole life was always pickup games because I lived near a big park where all the kids in the area would always come. So we always had games going on. We'd play wiffle ball. <clears throat> we play tennis ball over the line. We play over the line. We play racquetball, baseball. We played every type of baseball you can because that's all we wanted to do is play all day. And then when we played Little League, uh, as I got older into adult leagues and then co-ed leagues and recreational leagues, you know, I just always continued to play, played into my 40s into uh, adult wooden bat leagues. I just love the sport. I'm not the greatest player, but I'm not the worst. I'm always put high in the lineup i'm always put you know in a center field position or somewhere because i can run and i can catch <clears throat> i love to crow hop but what i'm saying is it's just that what i just threw at you that little last 30 seconds that's my love for the sport every single one of you that's listened to this podcast has the same thing but interpreted in their own way <clears throat> so major league baseball is screwing that up that's our joy so what we do here at ball and play is we bring you joy yay we bring you joy, you know, like, you know, uh, I don't know why, but ice cream in the wintertime brings you joy. Why eat something cold when it's cold out? I don't know, but it just sounds freaking good sometimes. How about a nice warm choro or your favorite snack at your stadium? Um, I have a list of places I want to go to. I want Trace Leches in New York Yankee Stadium. I want to try that. I would love to go to St. Louis, try their barbecue. Atlanta's got some pretty heavy food. Uh, they got that big old footlong dog or whatever they have down there. Uh, but anyhow, I'm kind of running off on a tangent here, but what I'm saying is, is, you know, we as fans, we love the sport. So when we, when you're picking sides, a large percent of a percentage of us aren't owners of anything. Uh, there's a small percentage of major league owners and, you know, uh, Rob Manfred and the, the powers of B it's a small percentage, just like in his government, small percentage <clears throat> tries to run the rest of us, which they think they're running, but they don't. But uh, I'm getting into political tantrum now. But what I'm trying to say, if anything, on this stupid podcast, um, is, you know, we pour, when you think of which sides you got to be on, I've always tried, and you guys listen to my podcast, I always try to be a devil's advocate. I try to sit on the fence. I try to hear both sides with a grain of salt. Um, I, I give opinions, but it's more jokingly and sarcastic. If you haven't picked up on my sarcasm yet, then woo, you got a long way to go, homie. But what I'm trying to say is, you know, we and I'm gonna work on stop saying you know. By the way, you know, um, and um, you know, and ums are my crutches, guys. Seriously, I hate those. I'm just all over the map right now. But uh, you know, you get a little bit of weed, and this is how you feel. So, with the current situation, the majority of us that are social media fans and everything, we're gonna be leaning more towards the players naturally, because again, a small percentage of us are owners of anything. We don't think like owners. But here's the thing I'm kind of throwing it at the world is if I'm Major League Baseball, why the hell did you wait till December 5th to start figuring this shit out? Seriously, I'm going to go on my soapbox right now. You had since what, 2017 when the last CBA was signed to figure this shit out and you guys waited till December. So I've always been on the fence, but right now the way the CBA is going, uh, they're still negotiating today. So that's a positive sign, but just the way the owners have acted pisses me off. Because it's like you've had ample amount of time to figure this out. It's like any other job you've had. Uh, when you get your annual review, 
your boss will wait till the annual review to review it and take and capulates what they think what you did throughout 12 months, which is total bullshit. The smart thing to do as an employee, what you do is what the players are doing. You keep track of all your highlights. You keep track of all your times. You know, you're always on time. You started early. You helped out in this situation. You, you know, you stood up in this situation. A smart employee. I'm telling you, especially young people, this is how you get ahead. Write all that shit down. So when your review comes up and they go, oh, you're satisfactory with customer service. And you're like, excuse me, dickhead. No, I got freaking 15 examples of exemplary behavior in my workplace recognized by you and the top manager for customer service. Oh, oh, yeah. And this date I did this. This date I did that. Put that at your pipe and smoke it. Unfortunately, the way society is today, and I've worked in corporate America 20 plus years, guys, I know what I'm talking about. I've been a supervisor. I've been a consultant. I've been a regular employee. I tell you, you got to cover your ass because they don't give a shit. Just like Major League Baseball is exactly the same situation as a player. You've got to cover your ass. You've got to bring something good to the table. And that's what the players are doing. You don't see the players bitching and whining in the media. You don't see the players making threats you don't see players doing anything close to what major league baseball is doing so i am now officially not on the fence i'm down off the fence in the player side because i'm freaking sick and tired of this shit i've been patient since december i've been feeding you guys information but you know what owners and players owners and players uh, owners are owners players are employees think of it like a job a parent is a parent and you are the child so there's always going to be this dynamic of power because they are the parent and they know best and you're the child and you don't know shit. Which is, for the most part, true, guys. Come on. Eat some crow. But uh, there's often times the younger party or the other party is completely right. And if the other side doesn't bury their pride and be respectable, then the relationship gap grows. I'm not a psychologist, but I think that's pretty basic in life. You know what I'm saying with friendships? So, nevertheless, owners are the company and the players are the employees. We get that. We get that. But here's the thing. I, I put the onus on the the point I'm getting to is I'm putting the onus on the owners. You've had freaking since 2017. Now you wait till now to negotiate with the players. That's on you. The players were ready. The players have been talking about it. And I know the owners are talking about it too. I'm not giving a hard time to the owners. When I talk owners, I'm not looking at people that were former GMs or uh, former, you know, uh, uh, presidents of baseball operations. I'm talking about the Rob Manfred and the and the clones that are up there in the mothership, they're the ones that we're talking about. So my challenge to you, Rob Manfred, and hopefully you're gone soon. I'm not a fan of you as a commissioner. I think you could do much better, but you just continuously let the fans down. Why don't you guys, once this CBA is agreed upon, hopefully this week, so we can get a little bit of spring training and baseball start on time, which we're probably going to lose games. Why don't you start after you agree with the CBA, once you freaking start on the next CBA? Why wait four more years? Why don't you just start, okay, we just agreed to it. Yay, all the fans in the world are, yay, there's going to be criticism. You know what would be smart if your ownership of Major League Baseball and Rob Manfred, after a couple weeks and you get a, all those negative comments you get and people going, yeah, the owners blew it, the owners did this, the owners waited 45 days or whatever, 30 days, uh, the owners kept making threats. If you, were the, if you want to bring fans back, I'm just giving you, I'm not telling rob what to do right now but i am i'm telling you from a fan side and i don't think anyone would disagree with me if you were to start by going hey you know what we're committed to the fans we're committed to bringing a great game on the field we're owners we care too uh we know there's been some bad blood in the past there's been some bumps in the road but you know what let's make this road smoother into the next cba we're going to initiate talking about it now now, granted, revenue sharing, there's going to be a lot of financials. A lot of you accountants listening to this podcast right now are rolling your eyes going, this dude don't know what he's talking about. No, I know more than you, dude. Unless you got a, over 116 IQ, then kiss my ass. You know I'm right. What do I'm talking about? The owners should come out and say, hey, we're going to start working on it. There's still things we can work on, talk about, so we won't go through this again. That would make the fans feel so much better. The players just going, hey, you know what? We just don't think to the way that we we want to progress with society we want to be progressive and you know what we're going to start working on the cba after the cba sign um and then the numbers we'll have to worry about the financials later and those will so that way when you get to the end you don't have to sit there and do amendments to the cba you don't have to sit there and go oh well free agency uh dh you know what you got it 
It's already set in stone. You talked about it for three or four years. But see, the only thing the owners might not do it is because they might be like, you know what? If I put it out there, it's going to come back on me. Yeah, that's called accountability. Genius. That's called accountability. That's when you're doing your accountable for your job, your life, your family, whatever. That's called being accountable. Don't be afraid. And that is very prevalent because I work in corporate America again. That's very prevalent in corporate America. I work a remote job. I've seen in other remote jobs, so I'm not necessarily talking about my current job. But there's people in corporate America that what I call they hide behind their computer. They won't communicate with you because they're remote or they're a manager that's in the office that hides himself off the floor. Those are the people I don't trust in companies and they're always the worst because why would you hide? Why would you hide behind your computer? And these are people that you send an email and they don't respond. Uh, you, you send them a chat message and they don't respond. So you're like, I know this guy's getting my emails, but he's looking at them and just going, screw this kid. I don't care. Or I'm a coward and I don't want to answer it because I don't want to put my feet anywhere where I'll be held to the fire later. That is a huge problem in corporate America. And I see it all the time. It's just a way to protect your job. It's job security by people to get in management. That's why they're dicks to you when you're underneath them because they don't want you taking their job. I mean, ultimately, that's what it is. And some of them are just like, no, I, I take pride in my job. No, there's a point just because you're intelligent, you got a degree or you're successful in your prior position doesn't mean you're a good leader. It happens everywhere. And unfortunately, people won't admit that. And they get prideful and they stick in their positions and they don't care. So that's what the owners need to progress from, in my opinion. Morab in Major League Baseball, I think you'd go a long way by just being prideful, eating some crow, and going to the fans and going, you know what? Our bad. Our bad. We're going to start working on CBA now. We're not going to have this again. You fans mean too much to us. Uh... And, you know, they're basically saying, hey, the games are going to be canceled. We're going to have a short spring training. But the main thing is what they're doing that is a dick move is they're saying players won't be paid. They won't be able to recoup the money for the games missed. So this is the problem. Again, this is the problem. Both sides are, are being punished right now. Both sides are suffering. But you know what? Once we get it started, we're going to keep punishing you as players. Again, that's the wrong thing this isn't the players fault they want to be in spring training right now players trust me they want to be sit there taping their bats they want to be you know talking chop with the guys they want to be you know looking at their glove and make sure it's the perfect glove for the season oh well, you know what swag they got what sponsors they have players want to get out there on the field as an owner where do you want to get out on your freaking couch or your little office there's a big difference seriously as an owner when's the last time you got dirt on you other than the bottom of your feet players get dirt on them every time they step on a field certain players i'd give barry bonds a hard time because his jersey never got dirty but oh shot to the giants fans you know i kid you know i kid i love giant fans i used to live in the bay area uh used to live in a town called santa rosa and used to go down to marin county brewery in the north county or north cal people know exactly what i'm talking about take the larkspur ferry it's a great experience if you guys ever go to san francisco i suggest you do this the larkspur ferry is a big ass big ass old boat serves drinks you've got big decks you can dance you can have fun uh, i don't know if there's much music but you know what i'm saying you could have fun and i've been on it a bunch it's a great experience and it pulls you up if you guys ever watched sf giant games in right center over the wall over that little trolley thing uh, you see boats, those are the Larkspur Ferry. So they pull you right up to the freaking stadium. You walk out like 30 yards. You walk in the stadium, and then after the game, you get like an hour after the game ends to get to the boat, uh, and then they take you back. And then you go to the brewery again. It's a freaking great time, man. I'm telling you, I love, love uh, the Bay Area. I love NorCal. But anyhow, again, this is me just ranting on the owners. That would be my suggestion. You've got a great opportunity to fix your these relationships. And, and, you know, let's go this far. Uh, a couple players have been really blasting Major League Baseball in the news. Uh, Jack Flaherty of the Cardinals recently. He is, his frustrations run high too. So he came out and just say uh, on his Twitter, and I'll read this verbatim, and I quote, let's just get this straight. We are currently being locked out. They did not meet us for a month once this lockout was instituted. Now we're being threatened that games will be missed. And if we don't make a deal by Monday... And it's like, again, games won't be rescheduled. They're going to cancel the regular season games, and the players won't be recouped. Again, this is a, you know, it's like, you know, it's like the kid. I've talked about this before. You know, you ever play in your um, neighborhood, and there's a kid that has a football, and he's the only one in the neighborhood that 
for whatever reason, has a football. And at some point or another, he gets all pissy and he doesn't want to play. So he takes his football. He's like, I'm going home. And all the other kids are like, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. And you usually circle them. Not that you're going to beat them up. But you know what I'm saying? I've seen this a million times. Kids circle them like, dude, wait, what's wrong, man? Whoa, 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 whoa. We're playing football. There might be eight or ten kids out there. And he's like, no, nah, I'm going home. You guys aren't living. Now, what happens is, is sometimes... <clears throat> You'll get the kid to calm down. They'll get the ball and be like, nah, man, we'll get you involved in the play. And, you know, some smart kids will be like, no, dude, don't. They'll work it out. They'll negotiate because, again, they're players. He's representing the owner, whining and kicking his feet. So no matter what happens, whatever agreement you get to, he's still going to have a little issue. You know, it's still going to be a little spur in his heart. Even if the kids agree him to stay and play and they get him a play and he's happy and he scores and just shut him up. But you know what I'm saying? It's uh. It's just, again, owners, you have an opportunity. If you start talking CBA right after this and saying, hey, we're going to progress. We're going to change the sport. We don't have to do this. We can bring your fans back. You can love your sport. I think that goes a long way. I think the fans would appreciate that. It will help heal the wounds. But here's another thing. It's still a wave going on. Marcus Stroman, who he blasted New York's Mets uh, uh, management recently. I mean, and it's, you know, he really criticized uh, the Mets for hiring their new GM, uh, Billy Appler. And he really, it's interesting because with Cohen, the Mets have been doing great. Now, this is an important season for the Mets. This is a very important season for the Mets. This is time for them to shine. Just like the Padres. Uh, you made a push. You didn't make it. Now what's going to happen? You're going to stay idle. You're going to fall back. You can go forward. Obviously, both clubs are investing a lot in going forward. So this is a huge thing. But to have Marcus Stroman come out and say this, because uh, I know Cohen as an owner, is he's my number one owner right now. I mean, come on, anyone in Major League Baseball, uh, he's he's pretty much making fans of other, you know, around the world of his efforts. He, But again, I think the Mets got a team put together last year, just like the Padres are put together, and it didn't work for either team. So you have to push forward. When you look at the Mets, you know, there was a lot of players that didn't have great seasons like Lindor, uh, McCann, uh, McNeil. Uh, you lost uh, DeGrom down the stretch. So there was things that, you know, the guys that had regular big seasons didn't have those seasons. And then your ace wasn't there towards the end. So there was things just like the Dodgers. You know, you got they didn't have May. They didn't have Kershaw. They didn't have Bauer. Those three dudes were healthy going into the playoffs. I guarantee Dodgers probably win another World Series because, dude, Come on, man. Face May, Bauer, and Kershaw. And then you're not even talking about the rest of the rotation with, you know, Max. Jesus. It, it's friggin'. They had, at one point, one of the most disgusting rotations in a long time. You have to go back to probably, like, Philadelphia, Atlanta, in my opinion. But anyhow, this is what Stroman said. Just look at the Met, Just look at who the Mets hired as their GM. That tells you enough. Whoa. And he actually wrote the tweet, and then it deleted his lack of awareness in the previous position is being exposed to the public now. I'm beyond thankful. I've gone. I'm gone from that organization. God got me. Whoa! You know, a little shot across the bow. You know, you're sitting there on your ship and you're reading your book and you're, you know, got your little drink in your hand. And you're all relaxing from a long day of work, and all of a sudden a freaking missile goes across your bow. That's what just happened. Um, what he wanted to talk about, and I think this is very important. He said the pitcher elaborated that fans made racist comments toward him and the front office didn't do anything about it. That's going to be the really the crux for Cohen. You've got you can't have that in your organization, guy. That will stop you from winning championships. You can't have front offices not doing their job. And I got to assume, and again, this reminds me of corporate. It's again accountability. Nobody wants to be accountable. If a player comes to you and gives you an example of a threat to his life, that, there should be no more notifications. You shouldn't have to ask that player again. If it happens again, you should squash it and take care of it. You should, you know, get your security on it. But this is what he says, and I quote verbatim. Endless death threats, being called the N-word often, hearing black lives don't matter, and playing for a front office who didn't care about any of that, still dealt on the mound through all of that, he wrote. Nah. And then he also added that he hopes for agent Mike Conforto does not return to the Mets, and he signs for another team. And um, Stroman wrote on Twitter also, I would love to be back on the squad next year. I've proven that I can pitch in New York. Others usually crumble, which is very true, under that New York pressure. Very true. However, I know a source who says the front office would 
Uh, rather, the pitchers put the pitchers on the market. I'm going to dominate wherever I end up. Not good, guys. Not good. I mean, that's not good for the Mets. Is it a deal breaker? I don't think it's a deal breaker. I just think it's, you know, a Cohen. Obviously, you've seen that come out in the media. He's got to address it, man. You, you can't have that, guys. You can't have that in this day and age. We were just talking about the Red Sox player earlier in the podcast who, you know, he played him, his mouth played him out of baseball for his racist and homophobic and everything else he said. He's just a stupid move. So if this is true, I mean, come on, man. Stroman, in this day and age, file a lawsuit then, man. I don't understand why you can't. They're former employers unless there's something in the you know, the CBA says you can't, but not, maybe I'm not that smart. But, uh, well, let's move on. Goose Gossage, who's never been someone to hold back, also blasted into Rob Manfred. And and so, oh, wow. Uh, geez. Let me just read you what he said, because it's just, it's pretty out there. Uh, but again, you know, we all know Goose. He, he never holds back. He says, and I quote, I hate that mother... You know how much I hate him. I called Hall of Fame chairman Jane Forbes Clark before the induction last year and said, Jane, I don't know where you stand on this guy, but I may punch Rob Manfred right in the bleep nose and spatter his bleep nose all over his bleep face right in the lobby of your hotel. Dude. (laughs) And I, I don't condone violence, guys, but I think it's funny that in a way that Rob... If you got someone like that, that pissed at you, you know what I'm saying? Like if I have somebody in my job saying that about me, I'll be like, first off, I'll be like, dude, hey, you know, know, here's my address. Show up to my door. Find out what happens. But what I'm saying is that's crazy. That's how pissed off you got somebody. So he wants to punch the shit out of Rob Manfred. Um, Probably not the best idea. I don't condone violence. Uh, I'm all for, you know, chew him out, man. Chew him out, goose. But don't put hands on. That's just going too far. Nothing in life is worth putting hands on unless it's your family. I'm just saying. Now, he also says, I'm saying, unless somebody's trying to harm your family, it's okay. I'm not saying put harm onto your family with your hands. I just want to be clarify that real quick. I'm saying, you come to my door and you threaten my family, just like every red-blooded American in the... Hey, right to bear arms, right to protect your family on your property. I'm 100% cool with that. Outside, that's a little different. If you're on the streets, I think you got to be careful what you do. Um, just walk away from all your situations is all I got to stay on the streets. But anyway, we're going down a different rabbit hole verbatim. If we start letting guys in that you still rage, you're saying, okay, for our kids to do it because the stars did it. Well, yeah, we've talked about that 20 years ago, goose. That's why Congress got involved in the first place because baseball, baseball wasn't policying it. He's totally right. Uh, when you get Congress involved, you're doing something wrong. We should never let Barry Bonds or Roger Clemens in. Well, I kind of disagree with that goose just because i've talked about it before i agree with dan patrick and other people out there you know david ortiz is in the door's now open and it sucks you can't let bonds or clemens in but they need to make their own wing or what you know like i said what other uh sports analysts said especially dan patrick well then let's put something on the plaque saying hey this is barry bonds great player da, da, da. he played in the steroid era you don't have to sit there and blame them you just want to let the person that's reading the plaque go and this is one of the players that played in that area you make your own decision. You do your own research. And Goose goes on to say, these guys have been already been rewarded monetarily. They're laughing all the way to the bank on something that enhanced their performance. Come on, you don't break the greatest record of all time, Hank Aaron's 755 home runs, having the best years of your career in your 40s. They're all phonies to me. Well, you know, it's I get what Goose is saying. It, it You know, he's pretty much blasting blasting rob and everyone and what they're doing and it makes sense it makes sense you know hey but i don't know i don't know if that really fits right now in this day and era and what we're talking about but let's move on i spent a little bit more time than i want to do we're going to talk college let's talk ncaa guys okay ncaa softball and baseball so the last two weeks have been fantastic um man so much going on ncaa uh softball and uh, men's baseball it's incredible i've been having a blast um a couple things let's start off with the girls girls side of it um girls uh let's see 
Jaden Coleman. We talked about uh, Jocelyn Allo. Now she's tied at the career mark HRs, but this week, the number one Oklahoma walk-off 98 against number ranked 17 Tennessee. Oppo, so, oppo shot by Jaden Coleman. Uh, what do you, I mean, Jocelyn's not the only one. That is a loaded team. That's why they're the best team in the nation. But hey, there you go, man. That was a great game. There's a, a lot of games going on. You do have to purchase the the packet. Uh, the packet for ESPN if you want to watch streaming. Because I've been trying to watch on ESPN 2 all week. Uh, I'm not finding games on VIP Box. I always tell you guys there's games on VIP Box. It usually happens later in the season. You'll get more NCAA games on VIP Box. Right now it's the beginning of the season. So you're getting a lot of these like classics or semi tournaments, you know, or teams playing because they have to play them a certain time of year. Uh, and they usually get do a lot of those in the beginning of the year. But anyhow, it's a, uh, it's off to a great start. It really is. I've been posting a lot of stuff daily on Instagram, our baseball news club stories showing all the things that are going on. So check it out, man. Check it out. There's a lot of good stuff going on, but let's move on to, let's talk more girls, uh, baseball. Or softball. <laughs> Sorry, ladies. Sorry. Uh, oh, yeah. And then I just want to, again, like I talked about earlier, I want to encourage young softball and Little League players. Get into it, man. I'm encouraging right now. If you're on the fence, you're like, I don't know if I want to play. Just go do it, man. Because you're going to regret it. When the season starts, you're going to be like, man, I wish I was playing or I wish I did do it. Or you might just be like, now you're going to be feel embarrassed to talk to those kids. No, man. This is, as you learn as a young person, this is called building confidence. This is an easy way to build confidence. You just reach out and grab it. Just step forward and go. You don't have to do much. Just show up, learn the game, and play. It's simple. You're going outside and playing, guys. That's all you want to do. You might not be the best person on the team. You might be the worst. You might be the best. But it's all about a learning. It's fun, guys. So get out there. I encourage everybody, if you're on the fence and you're thinking, I don't want to play softball this year, I don't want to play baseball, just do it. Whatever's preventing you from doing it, overcome it. It's going to pay off in the long run of your life. These are simple challenges for you that you can overcome as a young adult or a young person. It's not like you're going, oh, man, I just lost my job and I got a mortgage. That's crap. That's hard to overcome. You're young. Hey, man, this is a great learning opportunity because after you push yourself and get yourself off the fence and you play sports, you're going to the next year you're going to be like, man, I feel good about this because I've already that emotion's already been addressed. I've already learned that emotion is bad. I don't have to worry about that emotion. I've conquered that emotion. So that's what I'm saying. Get out there. But let's get back to girls softball. Now what I want to go over is let's go over the rankings. Um, Oklahoma. One. 15-0. Alabama ranked two. Florida ranked three. Let me do it this way. Florida at number four, Florida State. Number five, UCLA. Number six, Virginia Tech. Number seven, Duke. Number eight, Arkansas. Number nine, Oklahoma State. Number 10, Washington. Number 11, Northwestern. Number 12, Mizzou. Missouri. Number 13, Clemson. Number 14, Kentucky. Number 15, Oregon. Number 16, Michigan. At 8 and 5. Yeah. Number 17, Tennessee. 9 and 6. Number 18, Arizona. Number 19, Georgia. Number 20, Auburn. Number 21, Louisiana. Hey, number 22, LSU. Number 23, South Florida. Number 24, Arizona State. We talked about them. Number 25, Oregon State. That is your top 25 softball as of yesterday. Great games going on, guys. A lot of stuff going on in softball. Again, Jocelyn Allo, that's the one you guys got to watch, man. Got to watch her every day. She's getting ready to lead, set the record for most home runs in division uh, career history. So check it out. Now, Oregon State entered the rankings at number 25 after going 5-0 against Mary Nutter. Uh, the Beavers replaced BYU, which dropped from the poll. Uh, they were in the poll before. Now, Northwestern slipped from the top 10 after suffering two straight losses to unranked teams to end uh, the Mary Nutter teams that end the Mary Nutter, which uh, negated some quality wins earlier in the event. So that was the event. OSU's arrival gives the Pac-12 six ranked teams. The SEC continues to lead the way with nine. The ACC has four teams represented in, in NCAA softball, and the Big 12 and Big 10 have two apiece, while the Sun Belt and the ACC have, or AAC, excuse me, have one. So, good times, man. 
get into it guys just go to ncaa.com you'll find everything there for you but uh let's move on and let me tell you a story boys and girls every now and then something happens in college sports that's just super fun to watch and i hope it continues but as of today you know i'm going to be talking about nc state wolfpack tommy white or aka tommy tanks as of today he comes into the uh they play tomorrow they don't play today tuesday march sec uh march 1st they play Mar uh, wednesday march 2nd uh tommy tanks nine home runs in eight games 29 home runs 588 rbis i'm um, at 588 <laughs> batting average sorry guys so again his line in eight games, nine homers, 29 RBIs, 588 average. He is a freshman. He's won player of the week for collegiate baseball two weeks in a row. Uh, he's been named. And, dude, just looking great. Just looking great. Tanking it. But when you look at the top 25, it kind of scratches your head a little bit. Why are they so far down compared to, you know, Stanford, for example. I don't know. So let's go over the top 25, and we'll talk more about that. But, again, Stanford... Okay, well, I'm just going to go. Because I, I there's I want to talk about the top 25, but if I start talking about it now, it won't make sense to you. So top 25. NCAA rankings as of Division One as of February 27th. Texas, number one at 8-0. No. Number two, Ole Miss. Number three, Arkansas. Number four, Oklahoma State. Number five, Vandy boys, number six, Stanford Cardinals, number seven, LSU, number eight, the Wolfpack, number nine, Mississippi State, number 10, Florida State, number 11, Arizona, number 12, Notre Dame, number 13, Oregon State, Beavers, number 14, Florida, number 15, Georgia, number 16, TCU, number 17, Tennessee, number eight, Georgia Tech, number 19, Texas Tech, Number 20, Liberty. Number 21, Maryland. 22, Miami. 23, Sacramento State. Oh, yeah. Number 24, North Carolina. And number 25, Long Beach State at 2-4. and four. Yeah, don't figure that one. Um, teams that weren't ranked before last week was Sacramento State and North Carolina. Interesting. Very interesting top 25 there, guys. Now, let's talk about that. Do you like that top 25? One thing that sticks out is I think the Wolfpack should be higher. And I've heard that on a lot of people talking about that. Wolfpacks should be higher. Um, Longhorns struggle, maybe. But the thing that sticks out to me is... Um, let's see. Stanford did beat number three ranked Arkansas. But the thing is Stanford lost an unranked... UTCA Roadrunners last night, but I just don't understand how they're ahead of the Wolfpack. You know what I'm saying? But the Wolfpacks, there's a couple teams that don't make sense to me because when you look at the rankings, you've got Oklahoma State four and two, Arkansas four and two, but then you got NC State at eight and zero, LSU at seven and one. So it's interesting. We could talk the Vandy boys. I mean, why are they so high? They were one and two against Oklahoma State, but they're the Vandy boys. They're they're ranked that way. Um, I mean, Tim Elko also in the news. If you guys remember, Tim Elko was legendary last year with his injuries and his. He was kind of on the same type of Tommy the Tanks. He went crazy for a little while. Well, he made news this week. But with the thing with Tim that people were excited about is he said earlier in February, I'm totally healthy i'm ready to go he's banned 263 uh 417 on base percentage three homers seven rbis but he had a good game uh this week but um having a healthy tim elko for ole miss that's a big one he's been a the last two seasons 2020 and 2021 he's been a great player for them 354 average 325 um he had 16 hrs last year 55 rbis you know what's crazy is tommy tanks has already got nine home runs and that's just crazy. But anyhow, um, let's move into some other teams, talk about some other teams real quick. But, you know, Tim Elko, legend last year in college. Legend. Absolute legend. Tennessee went bonkers over Iona, man. Iona right now is just like, man, we just want to get the hell away from Tennessee. Uh, I think well, yesterday was 16 or 17 or something, but they scored 
27 runs in one game and 29 in another game. Tennessee's just freaking on fire right now. So, you know, this is if you play unranked teams and sometimes schools that aren't that good, this is what you get. But, you know, Stanford losing to unranked team, UTSA, that, that one's a big one. I don't know, you know, I don't know. To me, that's that's a big one, man. That's a big one. Now, we talked about, you know, the Stanford losing to U- UTSA is a huge upset, but the bounce back to the uh, softball side, side, number five, Washington, who is 9-3 this week, lost to ranked uh, 16th ranked Mizzou. But here's the thing. Mizzou not only beat them 10-0, but they one hit Washington. That's a huge upset. That should really flip-flop. You're a number fifth ranked team, and you get one hit. That's pretty incredible. That's pretty telling. So, again, that's just one little example. I forgot to mention that earlier uh, during the softball side. But let's talk Let's talk rankings for NCAA men's real quick. Let's start off with number one, Texas Longhorns. They're ranked number one. Uh, they played Rice the first three games, beat them well. They've been beating teams really well all year. But the one thing that kind of stands out, uh, that kind of raises your eyebrow, is they, they played Texas A&M, Corpus Christi. The first game they won 12 nothing. The next game, they barely squeaked by 5-4. to four. This is Texas A&M, Corpus Christi. I'm not going to take away from those, you know, from them. Uh, the Islanders are awesome, but, you know, I don't know. To me, that's just like, dude, you, you're the number one ranked team. You should be smoking teams like that. That shouldn't be an issue for you. But, hey, here we are. You barely squeak by a team like that. Nothing against them, but dude, that's that's kind of telling early in the season. But other than other than that, I mean, there's still a lot of games to be faced. They they faced Alabama. Uh, Alabama only scored one run in three games, but at the same time, Longhorns only scored three runs the first two games, but they won the last game six to one. So it's kind of like eh, it's still early in the season, though, guys. It's it's only eight games in. Um, most of these rankings are pretty accurate. But let's move on to Ole Miss's schedule. Ole Miss is 6-0. They've been pretty solid. I mean, they started off against Charleston Southern. Easily won those games. They've been kind of coasting along. They haven't really... Uh, VCU, again, it, the theme with Ole Miss is their offense. They've scored double digits in, in every game except the first game against Charleston Southern, which they won 9-3. But every other game, they're double digits. So they've yet to not beat double digits uh, yet. Uh, five games straight, they're double digits. They face off uh, today against ULM for two games and then UCF for three games. So, I mean, really their schedule, they get Auburn later on in March and then Tennessee later and then Kentucky. So you start getting into the Alabama, South Carolina, you know, starts Mississippi State. So starts getting more competitive. They did play Arkansas on the 23rd and beat them 15 to 5 for what it is or what it's worth. So Ole Miss is cruising, line, cruising right along with a really solid offense. Let's move on to number three ranked team. Yeah, let's talk about Arkansas Razorbacks. Now the head scratcher for people is like, yeah, they're four and two. Uh, they lost the first game of the season, three to two to Illinois State, and then they won the next two. But they weren't really that impressive. And I have a problem with Arkansas being so high. Uh, nothing to take away from Illinois State, but then you win five to one and you win four to two. So you're not really dominating. You're not like dominating this team. Uh, Indiana, same thing. On February 25th, they won five to two. Uh, Stanford, they did beat Stanford, which helps them. Because Stanford is a high-ranked team, they beat five or they lost five nothing. Excuse me. So this goes back to like, okay, you lost against Stanford, uh, Illinois State, you're barely squeaking by, and you lost the game against them, and then you just squeak squeak by the Raging Cajuns six to four on the 27th. So I'm not a hundred percent. Sorry, Razorback fans, but I don't know how you guys are ranked this high. I'm serious. Uh, you lose against a ranked team, you lose against an unranked team, you barely squeak by against Illinois State, but somehow or another, you're ranked third. Let's move on to Oklahoma State. Oh, yeah. Before I forget, this episode is brought to you by Baseball News Club and uh, your mom. Again, Oklahoma State's 4-2. And And they're ranked right now as of the 27th, 4th. Uh, They immediately come out and they lose against Vandy Boys. Okay, when you lose against, you know, a team that's going to be one of the top 10 teams or 15, it kind of keeps you still in the top 10, I think, in top 5. But they lose to Vandy. They get shut out. They barely squeak by in game two, four to three. And then they barely squeak by again on the next game. But they beat Vandy boys. 
but then they go and lose to Sam Houston 3-6. to six. I mean, it's just confusing. But then they go up to Wright State. They're very manic this year. They win 26-3, to three, and then the next day, or the doubleheader against Wright State, they barely squeak by a 7-6 to six game. So right now I'm not too confident in OSU and Arkansas being ranked 3rd and 4th, to be honest with you. And they're going to get tested because they got Arizona State coming up, Gonzaga, Missouri State, BYU. So let's see where the Cowboys are in another 10 games. because Or even 5 games, I think. It's going to be very interesting. But I, I really don't think they should be ranked this high. Just my opinion. I understand Vandy's a good team, but, I mean, come on. You lose, you get shut out, you barely squeak by against Vandy, which is great. And that's pretty much what's keeping them this high in the rankings. But then you lose to Sam Houston and you barely squeak by in Wright State. So, I don't know. Comment down below. I, I don't mention that enough. I need you guys to make comments. Help me grow. So, please comment what you feel if Arkansas and Oklahoma State should be that high. But let's talk about the Vandy Boys. Vandy Boys come out of the gate and beat, like I said, OSU. Uh, then they lose the next two. Ugh. Then they get postponed against North Alabama. Uh, they go up against Evansville. Quality win, 9-0. Then uh, three games against Army. So really, it's kind of hard to measure the Vandy boys right now. And the fact that they're ranked so high, again, it's kind of like scratching your head. They got Central Arkansas coming up today, the first. And then they got Hawaii for three games. And then they got Wagner. So they're Vandy boys, I don't think until you get until uh, March 15th when they face Michigan, Mizzou, and South Carolina, and Tennessee towards the beginning of April. I don't think they're really going to be tested just yet. Let's go into stats. Uh, Division one, baseball, ETSU, Leo, uh, Jiminian, batting 667. Woo, Jack Hurley of Virginia Tech, 636. Uh, Jake Giloff of Virginia, 611. White Hensiller, Penn, 600. JT Jarrett, NC State. Dude, Wolfpack representing 591. Tommy Tanks, 588. Tryson Hughes, Mercer, 579, along with Kobe Shade of Oregon Ducks, 579. Uh, when you look at uh, team batting average, Tennessee's bat 395, Wolfpack's bat 391, Wake Forest 390, Oregon State, Beavers 379, Virginia Tech 366. Woo -woo. And then um, earn run average, there's a lot of guys with donuts right now, so it's a little too early in the this, this season to talk about it, but if you want to talk about why the Longhorns are number one, well, they've got the best team ERA. They're at .50. Woo! Dude, .50. That's crazy. That's video game numbers. Uh, UCF, .86. Tennessee, .89. Belmont, 1.12. St. Mary's of California, 1.14. Uh, McNeese, 1.55. Virginia, 1.57. Georgia, 1.60. So on and so forth. So, woo! Some fantastic stats there. Um, all right, guys. Let's just wrap this up. There's not. I'm going to be, again, each week, NCAA is going to get better and better, uh, even if Major League Baseball starts. But no matter what, just check out our, our uh, YouTube channel, Baseball News Club. We just posted uh, Stanford's upset. The video quality is not that great, but we posted it, and we also posted a Fernando Tatis uh, special moment. Uh, we did that la late last night. I was up after midnight posting stuff for you guys. But check us out on Instagram. Please comment. Please download our podcast. And uh, we'll hopefully Major League Baseball gets their shit together and we don't have to not talk about spring training because I'm just dying to hear the sound of a ball hitting a glove and a ball hitting a bat. So anyways, thank you very much for listening to the podcast. This is Sesma signing out. Ball and Play presented by Baseball News Club. <laughs>